OTAN Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. We'll start here, folks. Thank you again for joining us. We wanted to share with you a little bit more about our Digital Leadership Academy, aka DLAC. And we love our acronyms, right? And so at OTAN today, I am Netta Anasari, and Technology Projects Coordinator. And I'm Penny Pearson, just give you that little housekeeping bit. I'm a coordinator for the distance learning projects at OTAN. So I'm going to start us off by asking our team from Placer School for Adults to in introduce themselves. And I'll start with Arij Musa. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Okay. Arish Musa with Plaza School for Adults, uh, CTE coordinator. You want me to introduce my team? You want to hand it to Beth? Okay. Beth? I'm Beth Lanning, and I am the counselor here, at Plaza, one of the counselors here at Plaza School for Adults. No? Michelle? And I'm Michelle Raymond, and I am an admin assistant and a teacher um, for CTE here at Pastor School for Adults. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Anderson. I'm a, here at Pastor School for Adults. Um, I'm an IT site admin, admin, and I'm also a CTE instructor uh, as well. Thank you. Hello, and San Diego, go ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Nate Sotsdeva. I'm the program manager for the San Diego Adult School with San Diego Unified. Hi, my name is Nicole Lincoln, and I'm a teacher in the San Diego Adult School in San Diego Unified. And Francis. Hi, I'm, I'm Francis Tony Benny de Souza, and I'm an ESL teacher at Pittsburgh Adult. Um, and taught distance before we all went distance. Mansoor? Yes, and my name is Mansoor Azame, and I am an ESL teacher as well as the tech support and helping develop the digital boot camp. <coughs> we have a special guest with us today, DLAC2 participant, Martha Clayton. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Martha Clayton. I am at my home college is uh, Los Angeles City College, which is part of the Los Angeles Community College District uh, at City College. I am a uh, full time faculty member in non credit teaching ESL and vessel. Uh, and for three years, I was the digital literacy coordinator. Thank you, Martha. Sure. All right, let's dive in. Who, what, why, Penny? Oh, yes. Um, I, I think I got this slide because I've been with OTAN for a long time. <laughs> so do you like the Digital Leadership Academy is really meant to look at bringing teams together. And these teams are distributed as much as possible, um, fairly geographically across the state of California. And our, our main objective here has always been to grow digital leaders. So part of that process means um, we're providing digital leadership training and leadership training in general. Um, we're looking at helping these teams recognize their strengths and what they offer, not only to each other as a team, but to their organizations, to their communities, even to their families. Um, we found a lot of folks find that particular piece of training very valuable in many aspects of their lives. Additionally, we're also helping them to look at team building, team strengths as well, to help them achieve their goals and what they're looking to complete during this two-year process for working within the Digital Leadership Academy. Of course, we're looking at building technology skills, um, and that may be from, you know, how to use a new piece of equipment to understanding how to navigate a piece of online software. It can come in a variety of forms, but we're there to help foster some of those additional technology skills that may be needed. And the teams themselves are, are asked to look at planning and developing and then implementing some type of program. It says distance learning on the slide, and there's a reason for that historically that I'll go over in just a moment. But these teams are asked to identify and find a way to incorporate technology distance blended in some way to help grow their programs. And 
these, this particular group was literally thrown into the fire because of the pandemic. And I'm sure we'll hear a little more about that as we move along. Our prior groups that we worked with, um, it was very much a choice about using and implementing a distance learning program. This time around, they'd already been, they were, had to do it. So it's, it's a very interesting dynamic. So all of this comes from the history. OTAN has always been providing some form of professional development uh, on, on a long-term basis, meaning at least a, a minimum of a year. Most of our programs were two years. It started way back with the in Instructional Technology Assistance Project, ITAP for short, I well, love our acronyms. And then it moved into the Technology Integration Mentoring Academy, TMAC for short. That went on several years. And then because of the press and push of distance, and online learning and teaching, we added the Online Teaching Academy, OTAC for short, that ran in tandem with Technology um, Integration Mentor Academy uh, for several years. And we basically discovered that agencies were getting so much out of both of those programs. We kind of did a, a mashup between the Technology Integration Academy and the Online Teaching Academy, and we landed here on the Digital Leadership Academy. So. Um, I'll let you see how we've grown and who our current cohort is with um, Netta. You want to introduce our, our, our screenshot that we have on the next page? To see I do. Have. And fun fact, real quick, I was actually a part of the Technology Integration Mentoring Academy. So, Me too. Uh, <laughs> we have a couple of folks probably in, on the line that were probably a part of our other professional development opportunities. Me so too. So our current... Yeah, yeah give, a, give a thumbs up in the chat if you were, you know, or say me too in the chat, because a lot of us have come from these programs. Yes. Long history of PD at OTAN, so very excited to share that with you. Um, DLAC 3, so we were able to actually increase our participants this time around. So this is a two-year professional de development opportunity. And historically, we've had anywhere between six to seven agencies. Um, this year, we have 12 agencies representing the north and the south of California. We are very excited to work with our teams. We have a couple of them on the line with you, a couple of others that have actually presented separately presentations throughout the Technology and Distance Learning Symposium. So look at those very beautiful faces. We love um, collaborating with each other. And yes, this year has been a little bit challenging because we don't get to see them face to face. So normally we have a really great photo session. We take photos of everybody and their teams. This year it had to be via Zoom, but we still managed to get everybody together, which is always good. So the application process is pretty rigorous and it's very competitive. Um, we definitely look at the WIOA two agencies that, um, that are funded throughout California. And this is an open online application that folks actually self nominate, right? So this is a, a teacher that's interested in, um, you know, addressing a gap and forming a team. And we always get the question of how many team members, can I just do it by myself? And so DLAP really looked at this as a, you know, we want you to actually see progress within your agency and doing that solo can get a little challenging. So having a team of two or more really kind of makes that more dynamic. And we were nothing without, you know, our encouragement and our support from our administrators. So that's why there's a component for the administrator to also not only sign off and say, yes, I approve and I'll be a part of it either informally, but there's also an opportunity of our administrators to actually be there along the way and be a, a formal team member as well, which many of our administrators have done. And we'll have a couple of them in this cohort as well. And you'll hear from a couple today as well. So again, a two-year commitment, um, and our teams will share that with you, share a little bit more about um, what that application process was like. So the idea is really along with, okay, your experience as a technology expert, not so expert in whether or not you know distance learning or don't, everybody does now. Um, it really is to identify what's the idea, what's the gap, what's the need. So we're hoping they look at data and not only looking at the need, you're looking at specific programs that might need to be developed. So it really does make the application the strongest when they work together, the teams work together to develop a project outline. 
So this project is looked at with the team members along with the administrator to provide the support. And then of course, then lead not only, we always get, well, can I have five members or six members a part of the team? Of course, we would love to take everybody. The idea is to develop the digital leaders and then those digital leaders go back to their agency and form their own kind of, I call it a DLAC light at their specific agencies where they can grow and make it even more dynamic within their agency. The idea is we do the training for our smaller group and then at, they'll take it back to their agency and make it into their bigger um, goal at their agency. I'll give you kind of a couple of minutes here to kind of look at each of our agencies that are on the line with us today. We have Placer School for Adults, San Diego Unified School District, San Diego Adult School, and Pittsburgh Adult Education. And so you can read a little bit about their um, projects and what they've decided are important for them to address during their time in DLAC. You see a lot of buzzwords in there, right? IELCE, IET is something that we hear. Um, a lot of boot camps, right? Career preparation, awareness, right? Accessibility, outline independent study programs addressing the needs of our ASE students. Um, so they are uh, rigorous and robust across the board and they are specific to each agency depending on the need they have identified. Okay, I'll move on. We okay. certainly have seen several of our previous cohorts providing a variety of different types of projects. And some of them have been very innovative, including from San Mateo. They, they created a mobile ESL enrichment program where they were traveling to their satellite sites with Chromebooks, created materials and resources for their learners at those different sites. Um, Baldwin Park, very involved with um, training and motivating their technology mentors for that agency, and then including them and training them on Moodle learning management system uh, in order to make sure that their courses uh, were available available for learners to access at any time. Um, also along with that, we saw Clovis Adult School mightily expand their offerings after they were a participant in DLAC. Uh, they've put all of their courses onto Moodle, but this particular project was all about putting their career tech ed nursing program on Moodle. And it was so successful that the administrator turned around and was like, Oh boy, we got to do this for everybody. Um, it kind of made our Moodle administrator a little crazy <laughs> for, for doing uh, so many courses for Clo for Clovis, but they've been very successful for that. So we, you see others here of, of maintaining an online course in Blackboard from San Diego Community College District. And then of course, Oakland, they've done a lot with distance, but their project was really about providing GED training and as a fast track distance learning program, because they at that time had an impact of, uh, you know, being able to accommodate all the learners that they could. Now, this is just a small sampling. OTAN does maintain um, the reports, uh, video reports. Uh, they were recorded when they were providing them during their tenure within DLAC. And the website is there um, on the um, page. We can post that in the chat as well in a moment. So you can go and look at what other projects did and how they, they went through the process of their participation within um, DLAC. This, this is a, as, Netta said it's a rigorous program, but we do provide as much as possible notice of meetings, etc. And we have a nice timeline to show how we've set that up for our participants. And here's the timeline. So we talked about two year commitments and um, to two year professional development opportunity. And so it is in fact that we keep it um, definitely packed uh, full of um, activities. And so you're looking at a screenshot of our timeline for our DLAC 2, and it just kind of represents the idea of, we meet with our agencies in October, um, we meet with them in person typically, the, um, those pop-ups in gray are typically meetings that we have in person in Sacramento at the Sacramento County Office of Education. And then those um, orange little pop-ups actually represent online meetings. So for this cohort, they're all orange little <laughs> orange pop-ups. We're all meeting online. Now our training days are actually a couple of days long. So we have about three days um, where we are online collaborating and meeting with um, some of our project specialists. And I'll go deeper into that and what we're doing with leadership. And um, they're also attending a 
DL 101 facilitated course. So it is a course that is offered by World Education. And it's really just kind of talking about recruitment and screening and orientation of students when we're talking about distance learning. Um, they have coaches assigned to them and we'll go over that in just a minute. And then of course, there are parts, a big part of our technology and distance learning symposium. We make every effort to get out and see our sites that are um, actually involved with DLAC. So Penny, myself, and some of our um, other project specialists will join us and we'll go to our sites to make sure that is there any other support that is needed? So not only do they have OTAN support staff helping them, but they also have their individual coaches assisting them as well. So year one is pretty busy. They have the course that they have to complete with world education. They have the online training days. They have the online project meeting days, which is once a month. And then they have year two. <laughs> year two, they're busy um, actually making those projects happen, right? So not only in year one are they thinking, they're processing, they're refining their project, but year two, they're completing another course with world education. They're meeting with us online to develop and support them throughout that process and they're meeting with their coaches ongoing. So um, not an easy ride, <laughs> definitely, but they're definitely up for the, um, for the obstacle and hopefully just learning along the way, right? That's just um, how it goes. We have to spend a little time to, to gain and earn um, some of those pieces to move our projects forward at our agencies. So that's our timeline. And it wouldn't be anything without their coaches. Um, Netta has mentioned them a couple of times, but we haven't recognized them yet. So these are our coaches for this year. All of them, you may or may not know. So some of them are in the room with us right now. Blair Roy, we've been fortunate to know her for quite some time. And she is actually a former O10 employee and she retired. Oh, and then we were she? able to, she's there. I see her. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, we have Susan Gear. She is the first one there, which I don't know why I forgot to put the name on this slide. Um, she's uh, the coach for Moreno Valley and Oxnard and Roland. And she is like the mother of mm. all things technology integration. Susan Gear is amazing. If you don't know her, seek her out and become her friend. Um, she is a, a wealth of knowledge on all things related to technology integration and ESL. And then the second image here is of Susan Coulter. Um, we have known her also for many years. She is a coach for Garden Grove and Tustin Adult School. And she's down at Baldwin Park Adult School and has been a part of our projects for many years. And she is just one of those people that can take data and take technology pieces, and she can fit them all together nicely and is, and is a great person to have on board as we start looking at um, these developing these projects and also in like looking at how effective they are. The middle image is of Francisca Wentworth, and I believe Francisca is in the room. So if she is, she might want to open her camera and say hello. Um, she is there. She is. I see her. <laughs> Thank you, Francisca. She's been also um, with OTAN. I believe at least from TMAC days. I don't remember, Francisca, were you on ITAP? Yes. Yes, she was. So she's mm -hmm. she's been through all of these programs and she's the coach for Campbell Union High School District in Pittsburgh and Santa Clara Unified. She is currently retired as an administrator from uh, Jefferson Adult School and out in the Bay Area. And um, we're really happy to have her because she's got the teacher side. She's got the administrator side. She's got all of those pieces that can help these projects um, get to where they want to go. Blair turned her camera on a second ago. Blair Roy already talked about her. Cindy Waslowski. I don't think Cindy's in the room. She I, is. She, she is Cindy, turn on your camera. Uh -oh. Say hello. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy is from our southern part of the state, San Diego. So she's a coach for San Diego Community College District and San Diego Unified School District. And again, she is, I believe, a veteran out of TMAC at a minimum. Uh, she is one of the original Blairettes. You may have seen that in the uh, in the chat and been involved with these projects for quite some time and seen the growth of them. So all of these coaches are integral to making these program projects work well because they provide direct one-on-one -on -one coaching and support to all of these teams. And we couldn't do it without them. So I give a big round of applause to them. Thank you for being our coaches. And I'm sure uh, we'll hear a little more about your efforts with your teams as we progress. So I think from there, uh, turn it back over to Netta and talking about our leadership training. Yes, so you know we are we make sure our teams are completely supported 
all throughout the way. So whether again, it's OTAN coordinators, OTAN staff, our coaches, um, they're obviously getting the support they need at their agency with their administration. But then we bring a different, um, another component into the mix and it's a, his name is Dr. Paul Porter. And um, we are very fortunate to have him as a retired um, educational expert. So he has been a principal, he's been an administrator, a director, he is, um, he's been a superintendent and retired and then went back into teaching and is teaching leadership courses at the UC Davis Extension and so on. But um, Dr. Paul Porter also is a trainer for Gallup Strengths and the Clifton Strengths Assessment. And he has also been helping us with the just identifying members' strengths and being able to use those strengths at your agency. So as a leader, um, we focus a little, little too much on strengths and weaknesses, and he really teaches us how to bring and um, enhance our strengths while we know them and what, we, what they are and what they mean to our projects at our agencies and even in our personal lives. So we're very lucky to have Dr. Paul Porter um, join us throughout the two years as he helps us with those trainings. Not only does he do strengths, but he also helps us with time management, conflict management, mentoring and coaching back at our agencies. What skills do we need to have to be able to approach certain specific topics, et cetera. Um, so uh, again, we're very fortunate to have the support system that uh, we do have to provide for all of our DLACers. So one of the things that we do like to stress to folks is, and, and it's been mentioned earlier, this is a very competitive process. So we get a lot of applications to participate in this program. And although we were able to increase the number of participants this year, that's not a guarantee that we can continue to do so in the future. So you can see from this, this chart that we've got our total applications, but we, can, we could only accept 12. So it's important that, um, be, you know, it's kind of an indicator as well as when you start this process, if you are thinking about wanting to be part of DLAC, start working with your core team early. Um, talk about what your what your um, unified goals may be for your organization. Make sure that your administrator is on board and understands the value that your agency and you as individual digital leaders will receive, because this is a competitive process. And it's uh, I'm sorry, but it's grueling for us to make these decisions. It's really hard, and so. So um, we want to make sure that you do a, a good, thorough job of creating those applications and getting them done in a timely manner, making sure that they're well written, um, coherent, et cetera. And then that will, you know, just gives you that ability to kind of rise to the top of all of the applications that we receive. So it's um, those that, that get in you know, applause to you of completing the application process and um, and know that, you know, you were amongst uh, the cream of the crop, so to speak. So we really appreciate having you here and we really encourage anyone who's considering applying for DLAC, um, start that process now. We hope to have the next round of applications open in spring of 2022. I think we're shooting for April, if I recall correctly. So you have time to plan. Okay, so I will go back to um, our to Netta so we can start a panel discussion here. Well, you know, as we sit here and showcase wonderful DLAC, really what we want to hear from is our um, agencies. So we have some questions for you and we do have three agencies that are going to talk to us today. So we want to make sure that we're giving them enough time. We have a list of questions that we're going to post um, a copy of these questions into the chat so that you, the audience, can uh, take a look at them as we're going along, but we're actually going to move on here and we're gonna start with Placer School for Adults. We have like, um, they've introduced themselves, Arij Musa, Beth Lanning, um, Blair Coach, Blair, Blair Coach, Blair Roy is their coach, um, Chris Anderson and Michelle Raymond. who are gonna to talk to us and kind of address some of those questions. So I'll hand the first question over to, um, let's see if I can find it here. We're gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hand it to Arij, who's going to tell us about you, your team, your program, enrollment, the community of learners, and the number of teachers you are leading. Great. Arij. Thank you, Nada. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to thank my team also for joining me today and for doing a lot of the work that's involved with that. And most importantly, Blair, our coach. We couldn't have done it without her. Thank you, Blair, for coaching us through all this. So I'll talk a little bit about the programs that we offer under CTE, and then I'll um, ask each team member to elaborate a little bit about the area they're involved in. 
So we have the Career Technical Education Program, um, Career Pathways for Plaster School for Adults. We have Building and Construction Trades, um, and under that we have Construction Free Apprenticeship Program and Welding. And then under Manufacturing, we also have Welding 1A. We have under Business and Finance, we have Accounting and QuickBooks, two levels of each, as well as Microsoft Office applications for the workplace. And then under health science and medical um, technology, we have clinical medical assistance program. And then we also have workforce uh, preparation, which includes digital literacy, um, career exploration, resume writing, mock interviews, resume critiquing, and interviewing strategies. And with that, I'd like to ask Chris to elaborate a little bit about um, his Microsoft Office application for the workplace and all the great work that he did, and then um, move on to the other team members to talk about the programs also that they're involved in. Chris? Great. Thank you, Rish. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the, the class of, that I'm teaching right now is the Microsoft Office um, for the applications for the workplace, and this part is, is part of our our path, one of our pathways that we have here at PSA. <clears throat> and what we do is we're looking at, we're covering a couple of the main areas here, such as digital literacy. Um, we all know how important that is for our, for our classrooms and, and working in today's world. We, we cover the office applications such as Word, Excel, um, PowerPoint, and um, Access. So um, we go through that. We are using uh, Canvas uh, for this course. And uh, I've been real happy with the courses and, and everything we've learned in the last three days here on Canvas. Um, been really good in uh, helping to fill in the blanks and uh, been really, really positive. The students really like it and they're just having a great time learning. So it's, uh, it, it's good in helping them to grow and, and be ready for the work for workplace. Uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Michelle. I wanted to mention just that uh, Chris Anderson is teaching his class online. So we have some online classes and some in-person classes and Chris's class is strictly online. Right, thank you, Arish. So um, I'll be teaching accounting and QuickBooks and one of the uh, ways that we're really looking at is to bring our ESL um, students into some of these career pathways focusing on our IELCE. And so we're, we're really excited to be working with our um, ESL department chair, Chrissy Agee, into bringing the, um, our ESL pro, uh, program, um, our program to our ESL um, students to help them get those um, very valuable jobs. So. Michelle's classes will be also in person. Beth? Yeah, I'm Beth Lanning, and I'm one of the counselors here at Placer School for Adults. We have another counselor as well. We, our primary role is to help uh, students transition uh, via getting their high school diploma, GED. We also assist with the ESL classes, um, primarily with uh, working with the teachers and uh, we all uh, we help with career and transitioning. So we do have a counselor here that is also on staff with Sierra College, and she is a um, transitional counselor to Sierra College. So students can have almost like a concierge service uh, with Kaylee Hogan, our other counselor, uh, in. She assists them with registering, and it can be very daunting for a lot of our adult students um, that are trying to get into college. So she assists with that. And um, we also help with resume writing, interview strategies. We can sign them up for classes. Um, our biggest program area right now is high school diploma. Uh, we have several adults earning their high school diploma right now. And um, that's about it. And then we have about eight, uh, 30 teachers under um, high school diploma, GED, ESL, and CTE teachers. And we serve Placer County. So Areej, can you talk to us a little bit about your project outline, what your goals and plans are for, the, for your project in DLAC, some of your challenges, and if you can kind of weave into what data did you look at to kind of determine that project, right. that'd be great. 
So um, we um, adopted the project for helping ESL students, Integrated English Literacy and Civic Education Program, 243 funding, working with ESL students to transition them into um, career pathways, CTE programs, and digital literacy. So I'm working closely with the ESL department chair to do surveys for the ESL students. And actually last week we completed a survey that gave us a little bit more information on the direction that we need to go to coordinate more career pathways for them to be able to find jobs and um, higher paying jobs. So we as a team are working together to accomplish that mission, hopefully by the end of the second year. <laughs> We're starting slow, this is our first time. So if we can get a few students this semester to enroll in Career Pathways, which is our goal, it'll be a great success. And I think we're working towards that goal and it looks like it's hopefully gonna happen soon. Great. Some of the challenges is the, really the, um, because of COVID, low enrollment, some of these classes are online. So it's hard to get, it's been hard to get pe people in the classroom. Um, so most ESL classes are held online um, and they're doing both digital literacy and ESL and um, introducing the students to the workforce readiness. So we have a few students are actually taking uh, reading and writing and math um, and some of our um, CMA classes also are some students are taking um, math and reading and writing. So we're seeing integration between programs mm. as well, and career pathways. Arish Penny here. Um, you mentioned that you had a, a survey. Uh -huh. So um, can you kind of differentiate a little bit between, you know, when you were applying for DLAC mm -hmm. and looking at your, your gaps, what data did you look at there? And then now you've got some other data that's helping you to kind of redirect. So can you give us an idea of what that looks like and what you were looking at in terms of data? Do you want me to share the um, survey with you or show present it? We were looking at career path. The last data that we did, the last survey was capturing information about digital literacy as well as career pathways. So so we're focused. We wanted to know how many of them have laptops, desktops, cameras, digital equipment, um, access to internet at home. That was um, a few of the questions were focused on digital literacy. And then the rest of the questions were focused on career pathways, what direction they wanna go from here. And um, collecting that survey helped us, help us as a team know that there are certain pathways that they're interested in moving, you know, towards and that's where our focus is going to be to try to help build those pathways to accommodate the ESL population. We already have some built-in pathways that they will roll into, but we found out that we need to develop new pathways that we don't have right now. Nice. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I, I am very interested in, in how, you know, you mentioned before, if you got some learners to enroll in your new program, that would be a, a mark of success for you. What else would be a mark of success of accomplishing your goals for your DLEC project? Um, in terms of bringing ESL students into career pathways? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm just thinking you you have a, a plan and um, it sounds like you're you're really making great progress already. So I think I'm maybe I'm being too much of a, a, a quantoid or something of saying, you know, are you looking for specific numbers or enrollments or um, something like that? It sounds like yeah. you're already halfway there. So I'm just we trying have to have a small number. My goal is yeah. bigger than than that. You know, if we have. Right few right now like two or three or four my goal is like double that or gotcha you know at least 10 but i was told start slow <laughs> you know start yep. slow bring a few in and the survey actually helped me um meet with the esl students actually myself and michelle and chris we've been sitting on the esl classes and asking students you know what area would you like to go into and what pathway you'd like to go into and um, last week, I found that at least a couple of the female students wanted to go into the clinical medical, for example. 
So I'm trying to connect the uh, ESL teacher with the CMA teacher and make um, that transition for them to visit the CMA class and see what it's all about so they can decide if that's the right pathway for them. So we're you know, building that bridge between ESL teachers and CTE teachers to work together and collaborate to make that happen. And I think we're moving towards that direction and it's working okay for us. So far. You know, I wanted, to, I wanted to back that up uh, uh, with what Areej was saying. Um, last semester, I was able to teach the uh, digital ESL for digital literacy class um, here at our school. And I got to work with some of these students that were just absolutely amazing. And um, they are learning English, but they're also learning the technology. So we were able to blend that together. Um, I think one of the, the steps of accomplishment would be you know, if I can see one of my students, one stands out to my mind is uh, Francesca, you know, for to see her in our pathway growing forward, because I remember her talking and saying, where do I go from here? What's the next step? You know, or I talked to Carlos and he, he's a very smart individual um, and, and he is knowing the technology, but he's like, where do I go from here? How do I how do I progress? How do I grow? And so I think one of the, the aspects that, you know, if if I can see their face here it, you know, progressing through our program, then I think I think that's a, a, a badge of success right there. Absolutely. Right. And the Absolutely. biggest areas that we found was in um, office environment, um, home care aid, housekeeping, construction. So those were areas where they voiced um, their um, uh, big, you know, request for those areas of career pathways. Awesome. Great. Well, I loved uh, also that piece, you know, that you shared with, you know, I have this master plan and I, I do have a percentage in my head, but I have to start small. And that's what we encourage everybody is to really focus on, on a small sample, right? So that we don't have to have that, you know, no, our goal is 90%. Well, let's, let's look at this a little bit more in focus and how to, how do we, how do we look at a more realistic approach? So very, very good. Thank you so much, Placer School for Adults. Everybody, if you have questions, we do have a Q&A portion of this um, presentation, but um, thank you for answering those questions, Placer, and we're going to um, talk a little bit with San Diego Adult School. Um, Nate and Nicole, same questions. Tell us a little bit more about your team, your program, your enrollment, the community of learners, and we'll go into um, the questions. So you don't have to wait for me to prompt you. We can kind of go down the list of questions if you want to give us a let us know a little bit more about you. All right, welcome everyone. So our team consists of myself as the administrator and Nate Sachdeva, as well as one of our lead teachers, uh, Nicole Lincoln, and our coach, Cindy. Um, through our Gallup uh, Strengths Assessment, we really learned that we bring a diverse skill set to the team. Uh, we've all melded really well together, and I think that that has made this process a whole lot easier, especially um, as we all know that it is a little bit more difficult to interact and to work together in this environment. So cheers to our team uh, working together. Um, our program is an independent online um, study program. Um, all students work at their own pace and only need to recover the courses that um, they were not successful at um, during their comprehensive um, time at our sites. Um, and with our enrollment right now, we have about 400 students enrolled at any given time amongst our um, community. And really the biggest thing that we have wanted to do is trying to make sure that we do have an opportunity for all students. And so that's what we strive to do. Um, regardless of their situation or skill set, we do try to make sure that we can figure out a way to make sure that they are successful. And Nicole's going to take the next part of the second questions. Forgot to unmute. Sorry about that. So as Nate mentioned, um, uh, our program um, pivoted really quickly. You know, we had already started online learning. So in applying for the opportunity to be a part of this um, awesome opportunity, we wanted to focus on two segments of our population that we felt are most challenged with online learning. And that's our ESL students and our students with disabilities. Um, our ES, the, the, the range of students in San Diego is diverse. We have students that speak Vietnamese, Spanish, Arabic, Swahili. And so sometimes these students come into San Diego Unified um, with two years left in high school and they're not able to finish all of the requirements. And so they'll come um, to our program. <laughs> and we wanted to 
focus on looking for opportunities to help them become more successful. In addition, our special education students um, are also um, can be challenged in completing the work in the, the four years at the regular high school and so they make their way. And so that's kind of where our focus is going to be as we move through this is how do we engage those students more in this online environment that we're in. Um, so we have seven teachers who provide services. Um, each teacher is located at a different high school site, um, but students from all over um, San Diego are assigned to each one of us and we provide instruction to them um, via Zoom sessions if students are, um, I feel like I keep saying, um, sorry about that, but we provide instruction to those students if they have difficulty in a subject matter our expertise goes from English, math, econ, government, all of the subjects that students need in order to graduate. In addition, um, we have one teacher who is our expert in literacy. So students who may not be performing at the level we want them to be, to be able to master the um, reading assignments on their own, will get additional skills with our basic skills teacher. So that's our team. And as we look through our project outline, um, as Nicole said, we definitely want to keep an eye on our students, our ESL students, as well as our students with disabilities. Um, we do have about a quarter of our population are students with disabilities. And we also, in order to keep them engaged and make sure that we're preparing them for success, we try to take a long-term um, outlook. So as we um, get started into the next um, part of our project, um, we're planning to start the students off with a strengths assessment on their own. So something that they can kind of learn a little bit about themselves. Um, is it a way for us as a school to get to know them as well? Um, that is something that we have learned is that building a culture and that kind of those relationships has been one of the biggest challenges. And so hopefully this way we'll, we'll also have some information about the student. And then once we identify what those strengths, interests, and values are, we can align those with possible careers that might be of interest to them. And that can also be something that can help them focus on their goals and achieve those goals. And then we can also map out the different courses that might be of interest and then the courses that are needed to get um, that career of their choice. So we're trying to take it not only, I guess we understand that we're in here to get the high school diploma, but let's look beyond that um, so that we can make sure that you're successful beyond leaving our institution um, and successful as you move forward. Um, definitely a gap in things that we're addressing, like Nicole said, um, our student with disabilities and our English learners have really had a difficult time in the online only environment. What we have learned that our um, program right now has really seen great benefits um, for our students who are working um, typical work hours um, or who are parents themselves. Um, because we have this flexible online schedule right now and everybody's moving at their own pace, students have an opportunity to do their coursework at night or on the weekends. Um, and then we can also provide those supports for those students. So that's kind of been our, uh, our civil aligning. Um, but we still have not solved how we can um, meet the needs of our students with disabilities um, in the same manner. So we do hope to reopen when we reopen and we can have um, students in person again, offer those in-person supports um, that are really needed for specific populations. Um, and as we're looking at um, the data that we're looking at, we're always looking at the number of our grad rates, um, making sure that students are progressing in their um, literacy levels. Um, we take Lexile assessments. Um, and throughout the, their time in our school, we really want to make sure that um, they're getting a strong foundation so that they're not only going to be successful in our program, but also when they um, complete their college course requirement. Um, that is one of our graduation requirements with our partners at the community college and continuing education. Um, so that if a student does have an opportunity or an interest to pursue higher education, um, they go through that experience with our support and they know that they are capable of doing it, whether or not they choose to or not. Wow. <laughs> I love the work that you guys are doing. I'm especially um, thankful to hear your work with special education and those with disabilities. Um, I think that uh, the tools like technology can be very useful to them. So I thank you. That was amazing. Right. Yeah. And notice a theme too, right? Where are we going next? Where, next with Placer was, you know, that pathway. How do we go from ESL to career pathways? And the same with San Diego Adult School. So that is incredible. Thank you so much for being there for our, our adult learners. All right. And then we want to hear from our Pittsburgh friends. So Francis and Mansoura, same questions. Take it away. 
Francis, you're muted. And Mansura, you're muted. Hello, I will let Francis take the lead on this. Let's see here. Okay, well, we have, we usually have about 4,000 students uh, a year at our school, but because of the pandemic, now we have 2,000 or so this year. Um, and we have the usual assortment of from 18 to 80 uh, people uh, in our ESL department, people from all different places, a large uh, Hispanic component, but many people who are here in the U.S. while their um, spouse is working in the U.S. for a while or college students who come to study and uh, long term residents who finally have it's their turn in their family to go to school. So. Um, we have a, a large ESL department, but we also have a high school and ABE department and CTE department, which is primarily uh, allied healthcare. And we have a, an excellent CNA program. At this time, we have about 36 full and part-time teachers. Uh, and um, that's our group that comes through. Initially, uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, we were already considering moving to Canvas. So this became our initial idea of what we needed to do for our campus was to bring everyone online as fast as we could. And uh, we changed our focus just a little bit because in the ESL department, not only do we have a new curriculum, but a new way of delivering. So we put more of our focus onto our high school diploma and into a our students and into building a, a strong, robust um, infrastructure for being online for, for our teachers. So our focus has been on getting our teachers into using Canvas and online, uh, our students into a boot camp where they know how to use technology and um, to try to build some equity partners to provide them with uh, the tools. And we have found that, um, for example, our high school department uh, enrollment is just going through the roof since we've been able to be more online. Um, and our students are appearing in their classes prepared to participate from day one, which is what is uh, very important to take some of that load off of our teachers, not just to have to teach tech teach technology at the same time that you're teaching content. Um, so we feel those have been uh, successful decisions on our part, but we have a long way to go to get our whole school up on Canvas. And um, we also found that just the energy of being there for our students and uh, Mansoura who runs our uh, technical boot camp for teachers and for students um, can tell you that just the energy of providing a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one assistance is what makes the difference that the person just goes with everything they've got. And this is one of the exciting things about being thrown into the pandemic that we've seen this result at our school. Mansoura, please speak to these. Okay, thank you, Francis. So when we initially started, we were definitely, yes, we were going to use Canvas. And a lot of people had this conversation of why Canvas. And I actually went with my own struggles of going back to college years ago and not knowing how to use a laptop because I'd been working in in, in the world, but I hadn't really gotten into, it was kind of an added thing like everybody else. So my own struggles of not knowing how to use Canvas, um, I took that and kind of ran with it. And so I could see that a lot of people didn't know what Canvas was, but then going back to why Canvas? Well, Canvas is everywhere. Canvas is at the community colleges, at the universities, at tech schools. So I wanted, I and Francis, all of us wanted to be able to say that at least one outcome would be that they would be prepared to move forward. And in starting Canvas, it was a conversation for us to say, okay, you're going to be using this at your university, you're going to be using this. So we have that forward momentum. But in doing that, we found out that teachers 
and I'm an ESL teacher and I teach Microsoft. So I know that teachers want to be able to just teach and not have to deal with, oh, this person doesn't know how to do Zoom or can't get into their Canvas account or can't get into Burlington or whatever thing that they're using or can't get their books or can't download something. So that's how the digital boot camp came to be. So the first question that we start with is what type of devices do people have? And that range is really, it would, the gap is so huge. We have people who are on flip phones, some who have smartphones, some who have, you know, maybe they have a, a a uh, laptop, maybe they're using a tablet. So me being able to know that I can serve them better because I can know how when I give instructions, how they're going to be able to process that information. So that was one of the first things. And we did find out from an equity point of view that not a lot of our ESL students have laptops. They're either using their children's Chromebooks or they are using uh, their phones. And thankfully, Canvas is integrated for that. So the first thing in Digital Bootcamp is getting that information and then finding and then teaching each of these students how to use Zoom. So all of those numbers that Penny, all of those icons that you shared at the beginning of muting, stopping the video, checking your participants, sending a message, going into a breakout room, doing your reactions, I actually have to literally teach that, which they need because some people, I can tell the range are like, Psh, no problem, easy to do. And some people are like, okay, where is that button? Can you tell me again? So that's important. And then of course, um, having a digital bootcamp where the teachers can also come in. So the teachers come and say, okay, I have this canvas, how do I do this? You know, they've tried on their own and they've gotten to a point that they need that help. So then I'm helping them with that. So that's really the outcome of Digital Bootcamp is to get those students on day one into their classrooms, be it distance, be it uh, hybrid, be it in the classroom, that they're ready to learn. They have the skills, not just a paper and a pencil and a pen, but they know how to turn on their Zoom. They know how to mute themselves. They know how to share. They know how to make a comment. And that really makes the teacher's lives so much easier. And that has been one of my goals. Awesome. Beautiful. It's awesome. Thank you. It, for for just a, a real quick question, Mansoro, your digital boot camp <clears throat> compared to what you did before to looking at the digital boot camp now, how many learners have you are do you have you served or do you anticipate serving in that digital boot camp by the end of this year, June 20? Well, um, I can just tell you that. My, my class itself has jumped from maybe I had seven, eight students to now 22. Awesome. And I've Thank already, you. and that's just my class. So I know Francis' class has jumped. And what the people were saying from the previous um, placer, they were saying that um, the parents are able to attend these classes because they don't have to worry about daycare. And this is part of retention. We were dealing with this when we were in person. Mm -hmm. retention was okay do we have daycare no we don't okay so then we have parent classes so we can offer that daycare you know and then we have to work with the consortium and make sure we have funds and so it was all of these things but now just having these conversation with these students like look you can attend my class and then I always remind them you know legally you have an hour you need to still continue working or you can go spend time with your family and then come back online on canvas and do your homework and the good thing with canvas and Zoom is that it logs all these hours. I know how long the student was online. I mean, there's so many different aspects of Canvas as we probably saw from all the beautiful presentations that we did here mm -hmm. that it has statistics. It has things that we can back up. You know, now if I change to an administrator, uh, we can back that information up. If anybody ever asks, we can say, okay, here's a report for this student. It's not just the quantity of hours, but the quality of hours. Right. Thank and you, Mansura. A very important part of that is that we've been able to make it part of the registration process so that when yep. students register, they are also automatically registered into a digital boot camp. Yep. So everybody will go through the process. And this is something that makes our, our administrators something they wanted. It's something yep. we wanted. It's something that serves everyone. That's the great part of our experience with DLAC is we're able to serve our entire school. 
Yeah, and I've That's noticed awesome. the students are just f when when they come to my boot camp, they're so nervous and they keep <laughs> apologizing. I'm so sorry, teacher. I don't know. I'm so I'm like it's okay. <laughs> they're like, oh, you're so patient. I'm like, it's my job. It's okay. You can ask me a hundred times. When they come, they're so nervous, and you know they're not professionals by the time they leave, but at least they're less nervous and. Yeah. That's a goal because why should that be something that hinders you from learning is just because of this one aspect. Right. Yeah. Thank Absolutely. you. Well, thank you, Pittsburgh. I just want to note that this session block, session seven, is actually a 90-minute block. And we we thought we were going to do it in 60. And <laughs> um, we're going, we're going to meet that. We're going to try to yeah. meet that 90-minute block. So <laughs> too we much have good some, info. <laughs> we have some more folks that you need to hear from. And then we want to give you an opportunity for a QA as well. So thank you, agencies. These are our current DLAC agencies that are participating. We call them DLAC three. Um, <laughs> we have in fact a creative uh, aka yet so we'll have to work on that at our next meeting folks <laughs> all right but we do want to hear from our previous cohort so martha clayton was a part of our um, second cohort and i'll um hand it over to her to kind of give us a good give us uh, some information of what DLAC2 has done for you what some of your project successes um, challenges and where you are today with your project martha uh, sure, thank you. Um, so yes, my name is Martha Clayton. I am um, a faculty person at um, LA City College, which is part of the Los Angeles uh, Community College District. We have nine colleges in our district. Um, my home college, City College, is the, the WIOA coordinating college for the entire district. So we kind of head, we were the heads of our participation in DLAC. Um, I had gotten a an email from OTAN and casually mentioned to my dean like, oh, this is something we should do. And she was like, OK, you're going to do this. <laughs> and so um, it was an amazing experience. Um, our community, um, we have just at my college, we have uh, during typical, more typical times when we're not remote, uh, we have 70 adjuncts. Um, we, I was just hired and one other person was just hired, made full time. So um, now we're running on our seniority list only, which is still like 50 faculty members. Um, we have, you know, ESL, citizenship, IET, CTE, ABE, all the acronyms you can think of. Um, and we usually service about um, 4,000 to 5,000 students. Um, right now mm -hmm. we're, you know, we've lost about a third of that. Um, and we're struggling between a third and half, but um, enrollment has actually been increasing a lot. Uh, we've also been getting a lot of enrollment from um, other countries and other states, which is really mm -hmm. interesting for trying to balance with the WIOA issues, making sure that they're not getting uh, WIOA funds. Um, so our community of learners is typical adult education as I think, I don't remember who said it earlier, 18 to 80, every language you can think of, um, every ex background experience, um, whatever you can think of, we've, we've got them. Um, we, um, our initial project was kind of like the boot camp that people have been talking about. When uh, we started in DLAC 2, we had just, um, uh, just launched a new student information system for the college for the college district. And so this was supposed to allow students to self enroll to access their office 365 suite um, to to access canvas which really nobody was using except myself and a few other nerds on campus and uh, and but we needed students to be able to get onto this so we wanted to create um, what we called the SIS workshop. And it was part of our orientation. Students would come in, we'd present this information to them, uh, especially targeting uh, getting them to use their student email. Um, and so that was going okay. That was like a cool project. Uh, that ended up growing into another bigger project, which was digital EL civics. Um, we were kind of the first people to put EL Civics on Canvas before pre-COVID <laughs> and uh, to try and streamline it. We piloted it. We did some pilots across like multiple class configurations, different levels, things like that. Um, and uh, it was really successful. Um, 
So we had students getting online, we had them checking their email, we had them using Canvas in the classroom with tons of support. Uh, and then we went into quarantine. And luckily, because that was like at the end of our DLAC too, like right at the end, we had just grad, I think we actually had they declared quarantine while we were meeting in in Sacramento. <laughs> and so we flew, uh, my partner on the team, uh, Carmen Delgado and I flew back to LA and found out we had three days of classes left on campus. And so we developed a really rapid response uh, to the situation because we now knew that we had 70 adjuncts roughly who didn't know how to use Canvas or Zoom. <laughs> and so we put together a whole um, Canvas shell called Digital Literacy. And we put all of our training materials there. We had wrap sessions online every day for the first two weeks of quarantine, doing trainings, answering questions, um, sharing materials, because nobody, people didn't know how to make a module never mind like where to get materials that they could put on that and the publishers were completely useless as far as um supplying us with anything that we could really use uh immediately and so um we were really able to respond to the situation very quickly and it was a hundred percent because of our experience with DLAC and because of our amazing mentor Susan Gare um, cannot say enough about the support we've gotten from OTAN, from everyone at OTAN, from Susan, and from our own district as a result, because it, you know, it does cost money for people to be sent to these, 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 um, learning opportunities. And it really proved that it was well worth any time and effort that they put into it because we didn't, we didn't stop teaching for a day. We, I actually, I take that back. We stopped teaching for two days. And then the following Monday we had students online. Um, and so it was, I mean, every gap we could have found, we were able to fill with um, the leadership skills that we had studied and practiced in DLAC and, um, and to really expand all of our projects. Um, now, um, now we're thinking about like, what is it going to look like in the future you know which is now what are we going to do when we have campus space available again um and i don't really have an answer for that i mean i think that you can't put a genie back in a bottle so you re we really are going to be having full i i i predict that we're going to be doing you know everything's going to be hybrid. We're going to be using the digital tools in all kinds of different ways. Um, um, I personally am actually planning on live streaming all of my classes because uh, the increase in retention um, and perseverance I've seen from students who have the ability to watch a recorded lecture if they miss a class because of you know whatever reason um it has changed the game with my adult learners the fact that they can go back and um revisit um activities assignments things like that and show their improvement after they've learned more information um even though our attendance has been lower uh, my attendance as far as um daily participation in classes has been a lot higher than it was when we met face to face. I have a way lower number of absent students. Um, and that's been a really interesting surprise. So a few of the things that we're doing now, um, kind of in preparation for, you know, our predictions is um, we're like, I'm working with the other uh, full time faculty person who is the voc ed instructor. So she's handling a lot of the technology classes and we're creating bundles where students can take like my ESL class Tuesday, Thursday and her technology class in the middle. And we align our courses so that way the material, the content and language is consistent across them to really accelerate their learning process. Um, we just did this. Um, we have one that we're doing this semester with um, an, an ESL for special, per, uh, English for special purpose, special uses course uh, that's focusing on uh, information literacy. Uh, my students from fall and winter were really personally impacted by what they saw during the last election. And so we kind of co-created this course where students are um, 
learning the skills they need to identify uh, reliable and uh, on like true information on the internet. And they're using that information to create PowerPoint presentations to solve problems in their community. So they take these two classes together and it's really already, um, I see a marked increase in proficiency in a shorter amount of time doing this. And it's, it's all because we've been able to like look at the different technology tools that we have and and um, take risks to do things that are that we never would have done a year ago. So thanks, DLAC. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was a lot. Sorry. No. I feel like I did a no, that was great. On that. <laughs> no, I first thing I'm going to ask is like, can I have copies of your courses? So we'll, yes. we'll talk about that after I, <laughs> after I clean up all the syllabi. <laughs> Uh, I love that. I loved your statement about you can't put some uh, the genie back in the bottle. I think we've, back. <laughs> we've heard that several times in different ways. And I think those pieces that you spoke of, of um, the successes that your learners are having and the persistence and they're, they're sticking with it, even though mm -hmm. the total enrollments may be down, that whole piece about they're sticking around and completing, mm -hmm. those are very high numbers. We've heard it yeah. in other places. So uh, Martha, you, you guys have just done amazing work down there. So thank yeah. you. The, the other thing I forgot to mention is our original project with DLAC2 was this was this student, this SIS workshop. And we actually kind of um, condensed that and refined that into a welcome and orientation module that all of our faculty are using in their Canvas shells now that wow. has like all the videos we've made and the, the picture and text step-by-step -step instructions. So students have almost like, um, like a user guide that they can go to at any point and it gives them a chance. Like I use it for the first, full first two weeks of class. I just have them go in and click on everything and try everything out so they can get over that fear of the technology and they can see that they can't break it. They can go back and review whenever they need to. Um, and we, we tell them about all the cool stuff in Canvas, like immersive reader is your friend mm -hmm. <laughs> and how to slow video down and how to turn on captions. And so, so that way, like, I think I heard somebody talking uh, earlier about, um, you know, the challenge of faculty, of content faculty trying to teach technology <laughs> when that's not your content, your typical content. This has helped us a lot because we can tell students, oh, you need to just go to the module and go to this section and, and review that again. And, and you can show it to them in class easily. So that's that kind of translated really nicely, like our original project to like this sort of moving forward stage that we're in now. What a great thing to have your entire campus adopting it too. That speaks greatly to well, what you have done. Is, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, yes, but I, I, I see what you're saying. And it's a uh, congratulations are in order for that for sure. Thank you. It's definitely. And, you know, um, since then, not that DLAC, you know, she's uh, Martha's brilliant on her own, but um, <laughs> since then she has become a full time faculty and she was doing all this working on DLAC, wrapping up her master's program and working um, with her with City College for the time that she was so all that happening and DLAC um, definitely was some other added some different components to it. So today now she's a full time faculty. So congratulations on yep. that, Martha. Thanks. We're very proud of you. Thanks. It's exhausting. <laughs> it's more exhausting than when it was like, oh, I'm going to get my master's degree and do all these other things. <laughs> but it's good. It's good. I, I'm joking. I'm joking. It's really good. <laughs> And when we talk about professional growth opportunities, I think that we've definitely seen, I mean, I'll speak for myself, you know, being in TMAC and growing within, you know, the OTAN and then working eventually with OTAN and so on. So we've definitely heard stories about professional growth and how DLAC really helps with that professional growth, whether they were in our, you know, professional development opportunities and became administrators, became tech coaches, became et cetera, et cetera. It's always nice to hear um, how it's also been assisting in professional growth as well. All right, so I think it's time to ask our panelists if there's anything that um, you have, any questions you have for any of our agencies, including Martha at um, LA City College. And now it's the time to ask, so you can put your questions in the chat. Um, it will be a little bit more flexible. We can un unmute <laughs> also and ask questions. So now's the opportunity, gang. Do we have any questions? OK, 
can I, uh, there's a question in the chat. Is that okay if I answer to that? Yeah, sure. absolutely. Oh, everybody always loves to know where's Pittsburgh Adult Education. It's not <laughs> Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's Pittsburgh, California. Um, I like to, I don't know, uh, Francis, how you want to say it, but I usually say it's about, you know, maybe, you know, Walnut Creek. That's like the biggest thing. Walnut Creek, San Francisco, Dublin, you know, Silicon Valley, about an hour and away, uh, half away from Silicon Valley and an hour away from Sacramento. So like in the middle, it's a nice little town. I've lived here all my life. It's changed and I haven't even moved. They moved from a town to a city and I didn't even move. <laughs> um, I was stationed. It's I don't know if you've heard of Concord Naval Weapons Station. And that's where I was stationed. So it's right ne next door to that. <laughs> and Pittsburgh Adult. And weirdly, my parents went to Pittsburgh Adult. Oh. 40 years That's ago and I'm teaching awesome. <laughs> and my dad tells me and my mom tells me about those stories that they learned and I'm like oh and I'm teaching there now so that's that's, oh, that's great cool that's yeah. very cool so it's come full circle so um, I'm not seeing much activity in the chat box here gang so any questions for any of our panelists or for Netta and I regarding the uh, Digital Leadership Academy itself Now's the time to ask. We have the time to answer. This is right, where I so want no the pressure. crickets. Right. This is where I want the crickets, crickets or the, the Jeopardy theme, right? <laughs> so I raised my hand, but I, I think there's so many people you're not seeing me. Maybe I Go didn't ahead, raise Blair. my hand. I don't know I don't what I did. It. Go ahead. So I, I don't know that raised. I did. You know, I'm trying to unmute three things, whatever. So <laughs> my question to the panelists is about the application process. Um, I have never applied for DLAC, so I don't know what that process is like firsthand. And I was wondering if anyone had any um, pearls of wisdom on filling out that process, because I think it was Penny that mentioned, or maybe Netta, that it was a little bit grueling, possibly. Maybe that was the wrong adjective, but. Thorough, thorough. <laughs> thorough, I like that. comment on that. Um, it is thorough. Thorough is a good, a good way to describe it. Uh, it's reflection. It, you know, you have to kind of reflect on what, why you're doing it before you start when you might not really know why you're doing it until after you start. Um, so you, yeah, you kind of have to think like, what's going to actually happen here and what, where could this go? You know, we started with something totally different and we had to consider nine colleges, like hopefully that they would adapt, the, adopt the things that we were coming up with. Um, that's why we targeted this new event in our college culture and our, our district culture with this new student information system, because we're like, oh, OK, if we work on this, everybody could use it. Um, and then uh, but it's we I remember filling it out and being like, wow, I don't really know what I'm. I don't really know what I'm seeing for the future and kind of had to talk with my my dean a little bit. And and at that time, I was the only person from the our, our district who um, was applying like I had to find other people and convince them to do it with me because they're like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so uh, but it gave us a chance to kind of, um, you know, talk about some like issues that and I don't mean like necessarily bad things but just like okay what are we doing here what is it that we mm -hmm. want to do why do we want to do this um so it there's like um yeah there's a little bit of ref self reflection there that you kind of have to do um and then you have to write sort of little essays <laughs> yeah yeah no you're right so it was you're good right. i mean it, it helped us it was the first step and then it got us off and running so you know. Definitely. And and one thing I do want to make clear, um, because uh, Martha made the comment, I think somebody, one of the other panelists, is that participation in DLAC is at no cost to the agencies in the sense that OTAN takes care of, you know, providing resources, providing the training. Uh, when we go back to a face-to-face -face environment, we, we pay for the travel and the room and board in, in Sacramento. But as Martha said, there is still a cost to the agency because you may have to have 
a substitute or there there are other inherent you know kind of those hidden costs so it doesn't cost the participant any money out of pocket um you know there's reimbursements for meals and things like that that you know if if you know you want to eat an eight course meal we might not be able to cover that with per diem but um we would definitely you know try to make you whole as much as possible uh within the limits of our federal government but it, it is something that we hope that people understand that it is not at a at an out-of-pocket cost as much as possible um, because we do have the funds to make sure that you get here and we kept you, keep you well fed and um, we, we have great restaurants around us well okay mediocre i would say i don't know my colleagues no, may they're think good differently. They're good restaurants. we got some good they're ones good. yeah we always had a i and i just want to say too if you haven't for those for people in the room that haven't experienced DLAC, we had a really good time doing it it was hard work it was a commitment there were times when it was like oh i gotta come up with another presentation for this i i don't know if i have time but it was so much fun and every time our group got together it was like it was like a family reunion like everyone was so excited to be with each other we're still all we're still in contact with each other um yeah. and we still reach out to each other to to get support or ideas or to share resources it's it really um yeah it really is fun we we always had fun there are good restaurants <laughs> <laughs> you know, good. Um, there are good restaurants the hotel is nice yeah it's yeah. good it's really fun which our <laughs> our, our current because, DLAC cohort yeah, hasn't had the opportunity that. to experience but hopefully right. you know we'll get there so we can actually meet them in person and elbow bump or something yeah. uh, this has been very different for us of not having everybody you know in our clutches at uh, Sacramento County Office of Ed so but, um, yeah. Anyway, I experienced uh, the generosity of OTAN when I did my o OTAC a few years ago. Yeah, and yeah. it was really great, and I enjoyed it. And I wanted to tell you something. First of all, I'd like to thank our administrator Eric Verkin and Stephen Casperite for their support throughout this whole, you know, one year. And they're on the line too, supporting you yeah. all the way, even during your presentation. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I wanted to thank you guys, Netta, Penny, and Blair for your support throughout this. And I have to tell you something, without this DLAC, we wouldn't have had the focus that we have now towards this plan and this project. We talked about it in the past, we were going to make it happen, but we dragged our feet, we, you know, spoke of it. But with DLAC, it helped us step by step, put the plan together, you know, do the, our homework, get closer to the program, bring CTE teachers and ESL teachers closer together. And um, I'm thankful for that. So, and I wanted to thank in particular Stephen Casper for recommending this program a few years ago. I remember he asked me to look into it. It was one week before the application closed and I'm like, there's no way I can do it right now. <laughs> but I promised him I would look into it, you know, when it came next, so I did and I'm glad yeah. I did. Yeah. I love it. Thank that was yeah. thank you, Arish. That's great. Thank you, Arish, for those kind words. I was going to go circle back to that investment piece that Penny was talking about, and Martha. I, you know, we've talked to several other agencies that were in DLAC, and they talk about, you know, what you guys give us, what you know, what we actually experience throughout the um, academy is great, and we love it, and thank you for supporting us. But there's an equal amount, if not more, of an investment at the agency level, and that's mm -hmm. what we try to lay out. We try to really lay that out very clearly in the application for administrators to really check that off, to know that you know mm -hmm. it's nice to release your teachers to get the professional development that they need. But to actually make the project happen costs so much more than that, right? Mm -hmm. And so an organization and time, teachers need the time, teachers need that um, to, to work and to actually make this happen. So we're very, we're very impressed with the commitment and the investment that agencies make um, towards their, their people that are involved in DLAC and then the project itself when it comes back home, so. Definitely. All right, folks. Oh, well, we're, you're getting um, appreciation in the chat. Uh, plaster yep. Definitely. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> well All deserved. Right. 